So, we're going to be going, um, well, we, we're live now. Uh, we're focusing on our Rectory Bible study this evening. And the topic is five themes in Luke. Um, which probably means that next week I should look at five themes in Acts. Because, of course, they are the same author. Probably. Probably. Let me just grab my notes. So, <clears throat> hopefully you have the notes. I posted them on Facebook. And, as always, they're also on the website. Um, under sermons and series at the bottom. If you need them. So, let's start with this. Oh, got to get comfy in my chair. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is, like with most of the Gospels, the first theme, uh, in a sense, isn't a theme, it's the point. Uh, and the point of the Gospels is Christ, and Christ crucified. And how do we understand that? And what do we do with that piece of information? And all those sorts of things. It's, you know, uh, it sounds odd to say, but the point of the Gospels is the story of Jesus. Um, and particularly, particularly, the fact that Jesus was crucified. I, I know that sounds like a, a silly thing to say, but that's what the Gospels are... are, are wrestling with how do we think about Jesus all four of them all four of them uh, and how do we take into consideration that Jesus was crucified if you've got the notes you'll see there I've got a little cross and a little wooden uh, baby in a manger I actually made that a number of years ago um, as part of a school thing uh, when I was working in a school um, and that was part of the Christmas story which had built into it a reflection that all the way through that story, the end result of the birth was the crucifixion uh, and then the resurrection. And if you look at the, the little baby, you can actually see that it's got its arms outstretched because it's going to be, when it grows up, on the cross, which is a kind of a dark thought, but is, is, is the confronting reality of the life of Jesus. So, that's the first thing. And it's, it's, really, it's, it's not a theme, it's the point. Um, the other thing is, once again, with Matthew, Mark and Luke, we have uh, what is called the synoptics. Uh, and Mark is generally understood to be, by far and away, the first, followed by... Probably Luke, then Matthew, but maybe Matthew, then Luke. It really is hard to say. Um, and it's understood that there's... Uh, so Mark is, in the case of Luke, uh, contributes just over 40%, uh, 42%, according to Wikipedia. Uh, then Matthew and Luke share a common source, which in Luke's case contributes 23%, about a quarter and then the, the, the last bit, which is a smidge over a third, is unique to Luke. Um, and it's just worth being aware of whenever we read Matthew, Mark, or Luke, that they have that um, textual interconnectedness. Uh, if you're curious, the source for Matthew and Luke is often referred to as Q, and we do not have... A written version of Q. There may never have been a written version of Q. People have attempted to reconstruct one based off the common material, but there is... I shouldn't say there isn't. There is not one known to people. You never know what you're going to find in a cave in the middle of Israel one weekend. That would be very cool. But until that day, there isn't one. Okay, so there's, there we go. That's a little bit about Luke. So the first theme that I want to bring to the surface here is Luke's picture of the way time operates. And the term is his salvation history. 
And um, in, in Luke's mind, there is the question of how Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews, might become equal in the kingdom or the community of God, acknowledging that the God's plan, and God's plan is, is an important component of this, is rooted in the promise of Israel. So, so in Luke's gospel, God has a plan, and the plan starts with Israel, but it continues to include the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. And it's, it's, this is kind of woven all the way through. If you read the, the very beginning of Luke's gospel, uh, Luke 1, 1 to 4, you get the dedication to Theophilus. And in there, it assumes a whole bunch of things in that dedication. It assumes that there is an order. So an order implies a plan. And that that order points to the truth. And that the truth includes the Gentiles. Theophilus is a Greek name. Now, we don't know for sure if Theophilus was an historical person. Or if rather Luke has sort of a, a fictional character in mind that he's writing to. And so Theophilus stands in for all the Greek lovers of God. That's what Theophilus translates to. Uh, and so you can see already in the name, there's the strong possibility that this is about weaving in the Gentile traditions, um, uh, or the Gentile community, into the, the, the Christian community that has its start in Israel. So... History in this picture is essentially a threefold progression. You've got Genesis, creation, uh, up to the work of John the Baptist. So that's, uh, you know, the Exodus, it's the prophets, it's uh, the time in Babylon, the whole thing, up to John the Baptist, who is seen as, in a sense, the prophet who just precedes Jesus, which is really interesting. Because when you read those first few chapters of Jesus, we get the promise of John, then we get the promise of Jesus. We get the birth of John, we get the birth of Jesus. We get John's ministry, which leads into Jesus' ministry. You, you can see how that theme really is. There's this kind of just following after before it tips over into the ministry and life of Jesus. Uh, which essentially starts, in, in one sense, with um, Jesus time in the desert so so the next stage of history is jesus uh and particularly jesus ministry so the next stage of history is not very long you know three or four years maybe um and then the the, the third stage in history is the response to jesus uh, i've also heard it referred to as uh the epoch of the holy spirit um or the time of the holy spirit so if you want to think of it in a Trinitarian terms, uh, we have God as creator, then we have God as son, and then we, after the ascension, we have God as Holy Spirit. We'll pick up a smidge of that if we ever get around to looking at Acts. Now this idea is baked into a lot of things. Um, it's baked into the Western calendar. Um, so the year is 2020. Uh, and it's 2020 AD. And 1 AD is the year when um, Di Dionysius the, the Lesser, or Dionysius Exegus, um, which apparently the better translation is Dionysius the Humble. Imagine being the person who decides, I'm going to call myself Dionysius the Humble. Um, now, I'm sure that was a, a name attributed to him, rather than one that he picked for himself. Uh, anyway, so Dionysius uh, is trying to figure out where Easter goes. Uh, and he um, adopts the AD system based on year, what, working back to year one, kind of doing his calculations and all the rest of it. Um, and then over time, that system spreads throughout uh, the Western world. Um, so that, there we go, Dionysius the Lesser, sorry, Dionysius the Humble. Um, it also points to why Luke is concerned with history. So, now Luke is not a historian like we would think of an historian. You know, you'd think of a, a historian. Their, their job is to accurately describe history. 
And, and Luke's concerned with history, but he's not an historian. His question is very different. His question is, in history, how do we see God acting? And, and how do we interpret and understand the big history moments kind of weaving their way through, uh, through time and God's action in that sense? So history matters. But the important question is, given history, now what? Does that, uh, I hope, hope that makes sense. So the first theme there is just understanding how Luke understands and works with history. Okay, that's your first theme. Uh, second theme, second theme is Luke's view of Christ. And this is kind of uh, awkward in a sense because I, I think he's still trying to figure it out. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you know, when you when you're trying to write something, you're writing something, but you're writing it in the hope that you'll figure it out by the end to sort of clarify your thoughts. Um, Luke has a couple of, but it's, it, what we do get from Luke is we get two different streams, and they're best represented by the titles that Luke uses for Jesus. So um, one of the streams is the Jewish stream, the, the, the Hebrew stream, if you will. And he uses language like Messiah, the suffering servant, pro prophet, when he's talking about Jesus. Um, now, I may have mentioned in the past, none of those are automatically divine. Certainly none of the other prophets were divine. Messiah doesn't automatically mean divine. Even the suffering servant doesn't automatically mean divine. It's probably got a stronger connotation, in fact, to uh, royalty, uh, he, 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 Hebrew royalty. Um, but you can see that he's reflecting on the Old Testament worldview. And he's seeing Jesus as being, in essence, the, the pinnacle of those living representatives of God. At the same time, he's writing in Greek. He's, he's writing to a mixed audience, and he's using very carefully mixed titles. So he's using stuff like Son of God and Lord. Now, because we're Christians, we go, oh, Son of God, that must mean, you know, Son of God. But for Luke's audience, what it does, what it means is, in fact, no. Uh, it, it points to the Caesar, you know, and when the Caesar dies, he becomes a god. And so most of, the, most of the Caesars were, in fact, sons of other Caesars, and they were sons of gods. And Luke is kind of going, no, this is the son of God. He is the ultimate savior. A savior in this term is actually quite a political term. Uh, what would happen is, you know, let's say Caesar Andrionicus, I just made him up, um, <laughs> sends soldiers off to... Uh, conquer the barbarians. Part of what you re the response afterwards is, oh, they have been saved from their barbaric ways by being brought into the empire. So when Jesus is a savior, it's a communal thing, and he's bringing people into the empire, the kingdom, the community of God. And so we've got that kind of weird merging of this twofold tradition. What Luke doesn't have is uh, what would be present in a modern um, picture of Jesus, which is this idea of the eternally coexistent Son of God the Father um, in that Trinitarian sense. It's not that it's 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 not that it's precluded by Luke, but Luke hasn't got there yet in his theology. He's still working. Through that, um, so and we get little snippets of that too. In terms of, at times it looks like Jesus has been adopted as the Son of God. Um, uh, so you get that kind of that not yet fully realized picture of Christ, uh, which makes sense. I mean, you know, you're dealing with a 
two communities that have very different pictures of what the Son of God might be, and neither of those pictures are the picture we modern Christians have. So it's worth being aware. Next theme, next theme. How are we going? I think I feel like we're cracking along here. Um, hospitality. So uh, Brendan Byrne, who's uh, an Australian writer, he's a Catholic priest and an academic, uh, makes the very persuasive argument, very persuasive, that one of the central themes of Luke's gospel is uh, hospitality, uh, sometimes called table fellowship. And um, it's often seen as a theme, but it's also seen as, in a sense, as a problem. So the problem is then described as who's invited to the table, who's in, who's out. And, and you can see how that would, might be a problem. But uh, Brendan Byrne makes a very compelling argument that, in fact, it's not table fellowship that's the theme, but the much broader theme of hospitality. And you, when you have that lens, as you look through Luke's Gospel, so much of Luke's Gospel uh, is brought into greater light. So even if we look at things like um, the Incarnation, uh, uh, which is Christ, God being one of us uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, and we get this in, in the Annunciation to, uh, to Mary, we, we see it as, as Mary goes to speak to Elizabeth. She is welcomed into Elizabeth's home. And this is a, a godly act of a godly person. Uh, they go to Bethlehem and they are provided space. Uh, but in that providing of space, a sacred space is provided by God. So, so that, that, that gives you a little bit of a clue as to how this continues. Of course, in what we would describe as the Last Supper or um, uh, the, 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 the setting up of the Eucharist, we get kind of the ultimate sign of hospitality where we have the, the meal that is set out. And we also see that, in fact, in that meal, uh, God is offering God's own self in order to create a home and a home is an important part of hospitality. Uh, you know, these days we call um, hotels the hospitality industry. Uh, but hospitality is about creating a space where people feel safe and comfortable. And um, hotels have to draw that fine line between being a, a place of novelty and of comfort. Uh, and so it's a very challenging thing because they're in that sense not hospita hospitable. Hospitable would be in saying, instead of saying, oh, don't stay in the hotel, stay in my place. Uh, obviously, that wouldn't work for the hotel industry at all. But hospita hospitality is about inviting someone in and inviting them into the home. And that's really important. And so Jesus in, in the Last Supper is being hospitable, is offering that broad hospitality. Wonderful stuff. Um, Brendan Byrne sees the story of Zacchaeus as being kind of archetypal of that hospitality being invoked. So remember the story, Zacchaeus, uh, Jesus is coming to town, Zacchaeus is the tax collector, important part of the story. He can't see over the people, so he runs ahead, he climbs the tree, uh, and he's looking down. Jesus stops, sees him, or sees him and stops, and says, Zacchaeus, climb down, I'm coming to your house. Uh, and Zacchaeus invites him into his home. And Zacchaeus offers hospitality to Jesus. And there's an outside group, uh, literally outside in this case, because they're outside the house, who are critical of that, who are saying, doesn't Jesus understand what an evil person Zacchaeus is? He's a tax collector. Ooh, maybe Jesus is a false prophet, because he doesn't have that knowledge of, from God. And Jesus actually says, no, no, no. And he responds to the hospitality that Zacchaeus has offered by expanding the hospitality that God offers to create a, a broader space, a more inclusive space of the outsider. Does that make sense? Um, I hope so. 
I hope so. So, um, yeah. Now, when you sort of think of hospitality, and it connects to the salvation history stuff, we can see that, that remember, the salvation history is, in a sense, how do you fold the Gentiles into the hospitality of God? And in the hospitality of God, we see uh, a very practical example of the outsider, in this case Zacchaeus, who's not a Gentile, but he's an outsider, being folded into the hospitality of God. So, as with most of these things, the, the themes merge together. We've got a lot of merging symbolism in this one, don't we? So, uh, as we kind of continue to work our way through uh, Luke's Gospel, uh, there, there, there is a structure. Um, you know, stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the Gospels have a structure as well. Uh, and the structure is often theological, um, and in Luke's case, it's geographical that expresses theological. How's that? So, uh, in the first couple of verses, so verse 1, 1 through to 2, 52, basically through uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, we get the introduction to John and Jesus. We also get the very introduction to yeah, Theophilus. I'm writing this, so you have the an ordered account, a plan. You, you can see the plan. Um, and we, we, we start to get that... Um, uh, we start to see the parallels between John and Jesus. Then the next stage, uh, chapter 3 uh, through to 4.13 we get Jesus being prepared for ministry. We kind of get the handing over of ministry from the prophetic uh, pre-Jesus era to the Jesus era as it gets handed over. Chapter 3, we have the northern ministry in and around the region of Galilee. And part of what's being asked there is the question, who is Jesus? How do we understand Jesus? Um, and that's a fair question. Because how do we understand Jesus is the, the, the setup of the gospel. Um, and look, in some senses it's answered, in other senses it isn't. But going back to the Christology stuff, Jesus is prophet, servant, uh, prophet, servant, Messiah. Messiah is important, chosen of God. Um, and it's, it's also about redefining Messiah. So the Messiah isn't necessarily the leader of the army, but uh, perhaps the one who ushers in the hospitality of God or the kingdom of God. Um, so yes, uh, and then we also have that kind of that, the Greek, the Roman stuff. Then we get Jesus reorienting himself towards Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is very important. Not only is it where the temple is, but that's wh and that's where we're going, but it's, kind of, it's theologically the center of the universe. Uh, I know that might, might seem odd, but, uh, you know, it, it is. It's the theological and, and salvation center, the soteriological, got that word out, um, center of the universe. And so we see Jesus setting his face towards, is the phrase, towards Jerusalem. He is moving towards Jerusalem. And as he moves, he continues to teach and to, uh, once again reflecting Brendan Burns' material, uh, invite people into the ever-widening hospitality of God. And on the way, he is rejected by the Jews. And the reason I'm saying the Jews in inverted commas is because He's, he's rejected by the Jewish authority. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of dating argument here. So there's an argument as to when Luke's Gospel was written and when Acts was written. And for me, I would accept the argument, and it's, it's, it's most people would actually say this, the argument is that Luke's Gospel is written after Rome has destroyed the temple. Uh, because part of what you're getting is you're getting... Um, well, one, Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple and in very specific ways, which, isn't in Mark, which aren't in Mark's gospel. So Mark's gospel, Jesus talks about coming wars, which, you know, 
if you live in Israel at that time, doesn't take divine insight. It just takes an, an awareness of how uh, an oppressed group might want to try and rise up and overthrow the Romans. Um, or it just takes a vague awareness of Roman policy. But in Luke's Gospel, there are some very tight descriptions of the destruction of the temple, which many people prior to that just could not have imagined. Uh, they, they just couldn't have imagined it, because for them the temple was it was God's home, and God would protect that. Um, so I, I accept a later date. By later, I'm, I'm thinking maybe 74, 75, not 120 or anything like that. So... Um, and there are people who argue against that. There are people who argue against that. But it's a fairly safe argument. It's a, f a fairly safe bet, I think. Anyway, what that means is that as Jesus orients himself towards the temple, the readers of Luke, or the listeners probably in the first instance, are going to be understanding uh, that what they're, what's happening is that there's kind of this destruction coming. The, the temple itself is going to be destroyed. And so it, it heightens the emotional content of Jesus setting his face towards uh, Jerusalem. Anyway, so Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, and we we have all the all the things that happen in Jerusalem. There's the there's the speaking in the temple about the destruction of the temple. There is the Last Supper. There's the uh, prayer. There's the arrest. There's the crucifixion. Uh, and the resurrection. Uh, and, th and that's our structure. And so it, it, it's a sort of a five-fold structure. Now you can, you can narrow it down further, um, or you can do it in bigger chunks. You, some people argue that you're almost best to look at it as in two sec sections, basically before Jerusalem and in Jerusalem, uh, or Galilee and then focused on Jerusalem, but still we have that geographical thing. Um, and so that structure, kind of, if you keep in mind where you are in the structure, that can help you understand a bit more about what's going on. Um, so that's worth holding on to. Okay, so moving on to uh, the last of the sort of the themes that I wanted to pick up. And that's the question of women in Luke. Now, in Mark's gospel, and Mark is one of the is the one of the dominant precursors, as I said, for Luke. Women play an incredibly significant role, um, far more than they would have uh, in most other texts from that time. And women clearly play a role in Luke, but there is a question about the status. That women are given. Uh, uh, Amy Jill Levine argues that Luke maintains the stories uh, that include, including women that Mark includes, um, but the narrative. He, as I'm saying, he, we don't actually know if, if Luke wrote Luke's gospel. There is some evidence, but we're not sure. So I'm just going to say Luke. Um, Luke shaped the narrative in, in, in various ways. And generally it's shaped to present women as being faithful but silent servants and patrons. So they are faithful but they don't have much of a voice. They are servants and they are ones who support the ministry of Jesus. So it is worth... And that's a bit of a shaping thing. Now, I'll give the example. Um... So one of the examples, Luke chapter 7, uh, we have Luke telling one of the recountings of a woman who anoints Jesus' feet. Now, in Luke's gospel, a couple of significant things happen. One is, in Mark's gospel, the, uh, the woman who anoints Jesus is just before his crucifixion. In Mark's gospel, it's really early. Um, you know, it's, it's actually in Galilee. And she is described as being a sinner. So it's removed from the crucifixion, which is that really important uh, idea that has to be dealt with. And it is, 
she's silenced and she's made a sinner. Now, in all likelihood, she was because, you know, we all are. But when you highlight that, you're saying something, aren't you? You know, um, uh, if I was to describe someone as a sinner, um, it would be odd. But if I was, I'm, I'm saying something in particular, aren't I? So anyway, um, now her actions are lauded by Jesus, but she never speaks. Um, now, so if Luke is borrowing from Mark, the question as to why the story's moved away from the crucifixion and why she's, uh, yeah. And if, if, if Luke's not borrowing from Mark, if Luke has two stories of women anointing Jesus' feet, why tell this one and not the other one? And why, you know, so, so th there are questions. Being charitable to Luke, uh, there is the real possibility, I suppose, that partially Luke is trying to be hospitable uh, by, um, by presenting a, a, a gospel community that isn't so foreign uh, that people aren't able to enter into it. So that's one possibility. The other is, he's, if he is writing to a particular person, Theophilus, perhaps he's trying to um, just sort of make more comfortable in a sense. I don't know. But it's worth being aware that as you read Luke's Gospel, whenever you see women, he has a particular ideal for a woman disciple. A woman follower of Jesus and that is essentially the silent faithful servant and patron uh, so just keep that in the back of your mind as you read it uh, he has yeah now I think that was most of my notes I do kind of feel like we shot through that um, That's what I was going to say. When you look, when when we're looking at say the salvation history, uh, or um, the structure, and I was talking about uh, the destruction of the temple, I was trying to think of what's a good way to think about this. Now, if we, you know, the story of Job, uh, and so Job is a story. That is an attempt to deal with the problem of of evil, the tragedy of of of, of pain to the individual, and it's you know it, it's constructed in a particular way, and many very intelligent people have tried to deal with the problem of evil from all sorts of perspectives. And if we were trying to write a modern uh, recounting of the problem of evil, and we didn't take into consideration the human tragedies like um, the Holocaust. That would say something. You know, if, if you tried to do a modern narrative, you, you would have to include something, that kind of senseless uh, violence to a, to a community, to a people, the attempt to er eradicate a people. And whatever you did, whether you confronted it or whether you turned your back on it, it would shape that narrative. And, and I would suggest in Luke's Gospel, particularly around the temple, we see it being shaped by the destruction of the temple. It's, it's such a, a, an, an a, apocalyptic event that it shapes everything that comes after it, including any talk of the temple. So it's worth also keeping that in mind. Okay, so I think that's it. I'm going to see if I can uh, go in and see if there are any questions that people have asked. Um, uh, what do I have? Okay. Okay, so... Um, so, is Luke's treatment of women in line with the intended audience? Ancient Greeks and some misogynistic tendencies. Um, 
probably. Um, maybe even not necessarily the ancient Greeks, uh, but perhaps some of the Jewish uh, diaspora community. Um, so Jesus is particularly unusual uh, in terms of how his approach to um, uh, uh, women in Mark's gospel and things. Um, so it might have even been an attempt to kind of soften that blow for some of the Jewish community of the day. Uh, Jewish community is now obviously not, not an issue. Like, yeah. Um, but even then, I, I mean, Greeks uh, in most of the world would, would have not been as egalitarian as we would hope to be in the modern world. And I say hope to be because we're not. Um, oh, Q. Uh, as in the letter Q. It stand, so Paul has, or Alex has asked about the, 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 the oral source document. Uh, the letter Q, it comes from the German word uh, Quelle, I think, um, which means sayings. So it's, uh, it's an attempt, like I say, to, the idea is that there's this collection of sayings and stories attributed to and about Jesus that's doing the rounds. Um, and it's a fairly stable collection and that that's the source that is common to both uh, Luke and Matthew that Mark isn't using. So German uh, and it's just usually just a capital Q. Um, you're asking question how much of the Old Testament uh, scriptures would the Greeks have access to? Thinking about context. I imagine not a lot. Um, and when they did, it would have been just, a, you know, even now in, in the modern world where we have access to so much information, there are very few people uh, from, say, the Western world that have read the Quran. Um, and they, you can just Google that. Uh, so I imagine not a lot. Um, so once again, he's writing to this sort of mixed community. Uh, once again, that's another argument for a post-temple destruction date because it takes a little while for the communities to become mixed but still retain some of their um, kind of their their post uh, their, their their cultural heritage. Um, yeah, so um, they probably wouldn't have had much uh, in the Greek component of the community that Luke was writing to. Uh, but still some. And once again, although it's addressed to Theophilus, it seems very unlikely that it's exclusively for Theophilus. Uh, think of it perhaps like, um, uh, you know, like the um, Eeyore and Pooh uh, by A.A. Milne. They, they, they're written for Christopher, for Christopher, but they kind of very quickly, they are for the world as well. And so that might be a way to think of think of that. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I feel like that's that's all of that. Uh, I'll say thank you. Uh, good night. Should see you. I should be doing this again next week. Um, and we'll see how things go. I'll say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.